Welcome. My name is Joshua Gordon. I'm the director of the National Institute of Mental Health. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today to the director's innovation speaker series. It's also my pleasure to have Dr. Helen Neville here today, and I'll have more to say about her and her talk in just a moment. But first, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping notes. If I could have the next slide, please. If you do have any issues and require technical assistance, please use the Q&A box to communicate with event production staff. Also, please use the Q&A box to ask any questions you might have. You can enter your questions into the Q&A at any time during the webinar, and we, we will collect those questions and answer the ones that we can at the end of the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available in the coming weeks on our NIMH website indicated here on the slide. So please tell your friends, family, and close relations. If you like the talk by Dr. Neville and wanna give them a chance to hear it and they missed it today, that it'll be on our website in a few weeks. With that, it is again, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Helen A. Neville. Dr. Neville is a professor of educational psychology and African-American studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She is the past president of the Society for the Psychological Study of Culture, the uh, Ethnicity and Race, which is the APA Division 45. She's also past associate editor of the Counseling Psychologist and the Journal of Black Psychology and a fellow of the American Psychological Association. She's active in the Association of Black Psychologists having served on their board of directors and received their Distinguished Psychology Award. Her research has really focused on the intersection between race, racism, and African-American psychology. She's published this research in a wide range of journals and co-editor written eight books in the area. In our discussion earlier, Dr. Neville and I talked in particular about a focus on the concept of colorblindness and how it doesn't necessarily mean what it might seem to mean. In fact, it can be associated with other indices of racism uh, and uh, dispelling the notion that one can be colorblind in a society such as ours in a way that's productive. Dr. Neville, Dr. Neville has been recognized for this research as well as her mentoring efforts. She's received the APA graduate students Kenneth and Mamie Clark Award, the APA Division 45 Charles and Shirley Thomas Award for mentoring and contributions to African-American students in the community, and the Winter Roundtable Janet Helms Mentoring Award, as well as the APA Minority Fellowship, the Dallas Taylor Award for Outstanding Research. So she does, she's, does all the things that we expect of an academician and does it exceedingly well. She enjoys working with and in the community, teaching and lifelong learning, as well as fighting for social justice, as I'm sure you'll hear about today. Her talk today is on radical hearing, and Dr. Neville will explain that and more during her talk. And again, look forward to uh, interacting with her, asking her your questions at the end. Dr. Neville, thanks again for joining us. Can't wait to hear what you have to say. I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordman, um, for this, for the introduction and the invitation to come and talk to you about something that I am incredibly passionate about, and that is this idea about radical healing. Um, I also want to honor and give thanks to my parents who, uh, Dr., oh, I wish they were Dr., um, Lillian and Chris Neville, who taught me the meaning and purpose about um, radical healing, social justice, and what it means to live in that path. I wanna first start off with um, kind of doing a land contributions. So I'd like to recognize and acknowledge that we are on stolen lands. Currently, I'm at the University of Illinois at Urbana, which resides on the lands of the Peoria, Way, Miami, Muscoutin, Kickapoo, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry their stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity and joy. In order to fight against the violence that is currently happening against indigenous people, occupiers of this land must listen and amplify indigenous people's voices while fighting against their complicity. 
I invite you to continue to explore the histories of the Native peoples throughout the Americas and their contemporary survivance. I wanted to begin with a quote by W.E. Du, uh, du Bois in his foundational memoir, Dusk of Dawn. And as many people know, Du Bois is considered the founder of American empirical sociology. One could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. I like to start with this because here is this brilliant man writing at the turn of the previous century, observing what is around him and really being compelled to use science and research to improve the lived conditions of black people. I'll provide a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. When I was first invited to give this talk, I had a number of topics that I was considering. One was the topic around colorblind racial ideology, which I've spent over two decades researching. Um, and essentially, the way in which I approach colorblind racial ideology is the denial, distortion, and the minimization of the existence of racism. And we, have, uh, we know from two decades of research is that when people deny racism, that is associated with a whole range of anti-Black racism and other forms of racism. It's related to um, lower levels of social justice behavior, lower levels of multicultural counseling, lower levels of multicultural teaching. And while um, a lot of my work has focused in that area, that's not where my heart is at this particular moment. I really want to shine the spotlight on people of color, our strengths and healing. So today this will center that emerging work. I'll focus, I'll talk a little bit about health equity and radical healing, really briefly discuss what's the difference between between healing and radical healing. I'll build a brief context for the uh, radical healing in psychology, and I'll introduce the psychology of radical healing framework. I'll end by talking about five implications of what I think implications are for radical healing, particularly for NIMH as they move forward. There are a number of different definitions of health equity equity. On what's my left, you'll see the CDC definition. And I would like to highlight for us the definition that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, which includes like powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and healthcare. Our conversation today will be focused on mental health, but you can see, uh, and mental health, I really like this idea about healthy as possible. I define that in a broad way. Many times when we think about healthy as possible, we think about deficits, right? Lower levels of depression, lower levels of anxiety. I also include with healthy as possible, our right to live joyful lives, to have satisfying purposeful lives. So what is radical healing? I'm gonna start off with kind of just a general notion of what is radical healing. And I know some people were gonna have questions like, huh, what is this? But trust the process. Um, by the end of our conversation today, we'll have at least a general understanding about some core tenets of radical healing. So um, what is radical healing? It is being and becoming whole in the face of identity-based wounds. It's challenging and a changing um, oppressive conditions. And I'm particularly interested in looking at radical healing among Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. It's recognizing and fostering agency and solidarity and resilience. And it's also building the capacity to act upon one's environment for one's individual well-being, but also the collective well-being. 
Um, really, radical healing is a health equity framework. Um, you probably can see some of the parallels in what I've just said so far. It focuses on attaining full health with a focus on mental health among BIPOC folks. It works to identify and change obstacles hindering mental health among BIPOC populations and communities. And it strengthens or it's designed to strengthen individual and collective resiliencies to promote mental health. So a lot of times when we present this, people ask, well, what makes this radical? What makes radical healing radical? And many times uh, my fellow uh, folks from the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective borrow from what Angela Davis says, when we think about radical, we really mean thinking about getting to the root causes of a particular phenomenon. Um, so breaking that down even further, um, I, well, actually, I remember one time giving a presentation, and this presentation was um, the first time I was thinking about some of these concepts, and my partner in the audience asked me to differentiate between radical and liberal healing. Um, and that was something I hadn't thought deeply about. So I just wanna share some observations and thoughts there to hopefully differentiate what we mean by this liberal or everyday type of healing compared to radical healing. So there is this health equity example, um, the ETR health equity framework. And there's some really good things that I like about this framework. It does include systems of power. It does include some of these physiological responses that many other frameworks don't include. It focuses though on these individual factors where people are responsible for transforming their behaviors. And sometimes, I'm not saying that is from this framework, but sometimes that leads to blaming people themselves for the inequality, blaming them for their health, uh, food choices, blaming them for um, crime in the community, as opposed to taking a more structural view. Um, there was in 2017, the APA published the Stress and Health Disparities um, report in which they talk about racism and the influence of racism on African Americans and other people of color. In there, they discuss and they outline um, the research on individual interventions such as culturally adapted stress management, um, encouraging people to improve their executive functioning, a way of coping with and tampering down their emotional responses to racism. They talked about promoting positive parent-child attachment um, and teaching parents specific parenting skills. Nothing wrong with that. Um, and then uh, they went to community interventions things that um, access to healthcare and health promotion, increase economic opportunity. Well, then if we were mapping on to that, a radical healing perspective looks a little, it looks there's some similarities, but there are some key differences. So at the individual interventions, these might be things like social political development, increasing one's critical consciousness, deals with mental liberation and racial and ethnic uh, cultural pride, also included here is this idea of self-care and leisure. We are understudied in that area of self-care and leisure as if, again, we are unworthy of those incredible, important, um, I think that they are uh, rights, human rights. Family and group interventions deals with advocacy, coalition building, intergenerational storytelling, you know, racial socialization forms. So it's moving to transmitting positive cultural traditions, community interventions all the way from healing circles, education forms. I think the association of black psychologists are doing a really good job of the uh, Sawabona healing circles that they implemented during COVID-19 where they were providing online support for people in the community as they were dealing with stressful events. And then societal interventions with really reparations, redress, reconciliation. So um, putting some of the other societal interventions but adding a more equity lens to it. 
So in terms of thinking about the difference between this liberal versus radical, just a brief summary, the liberal everyday healing adopts a person level and focus in general. It focuses on the wound in the healing process and it promotes individual health and well-being. BIPOC voices for the most part and experiences may be incidental to uh, the research. The radical healing adopts more of a multi-system level approach. It considers the root causes in the healing process. It looks at both individual and collective healing and really tries to center the voices and experiences of BIPOC folks in the middle. Why do we need radical healing? I don't even know if we need to even talk about that. I know folks are here because you are concerned about structural racism. Of course, the great awakening um, during 2020 with uh, twin pandemics or some people call syndemics of, of, um, of the health pandemic of COVID-19, as well as increased awareness of racial discrimination and anti-Blackness. That um, spurred lots of conversation and interest in thinking about and thinking through the impact of racial discrimination on disparities of health, um, both physical and mental health. There have been a number of published um, systematic reviews and meta-analysis linking the association between racism and individual psychological health. In the public health literature, there is research documenting things such as when folks, uh, when people live in cities or states that have higher levels of shootings of unarmed black people, that that is related to lower levels of their reported health. So we know that it also exists on these other broader levels. What are, I'm gonna move now to really unpacking radical healing and then discussing the psychology or psychological framework. We know that a lot of the things that we think about builds on the important work of people who came before us and the people who are with us now. The roots of radical healing in the psychology literature builds on the rich tradition of liberation psychology, black psychology and intersectionality. Because of time, I won't have um, enough uh, time to delve into each and key component, but let me just talk about and highlight key aspects. Liberation psychology, focusing on self-determination and liberation, both on an individual level, dealing with mental liberation, as well as a group level um, in dealing at, uh, with self-determination. Black psychology is within the tradition of liberation psychology. We see this emerging with the association of black psychologists in the 19, late 1960s and with Dr. Joseph White who publishes Toward a, Psycho uh, Toward a Black Psychology. And I love the fact that this first piece was published in Ebony, which is focusing on a black journal. And here we talk about a strengths-based model because previously black folks, the way in which they were researched was looking at a deficit. So we see black psychology looking at mental liberation and strengths-based approaches. And I love the inclusion of intersectionality. Of course, we have to mention the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who's doing such critical work in this area. Um, and so we think about the ways in which racial oppression intersects with other forms of oppression, including gender, sexual orientation, class, and et cetera. There are some contemporary folks that we draw on heavily, um, including Lillian Comas Diaz, who talks about ethnopolitical psychology, and Tama uh, Bryant Davis, who is the current incoming president of the American Psychological Association, who really for decades have been looking at the psychology of like healing from racism, really important. And Sean Jinwright, who explicitly talks about radical healing among youth in the education literature. So let's now delve into the psychology of radical healing. I wanna introduce you to a group of people that are just amazing. 
Um, when I was president of Division 45 of the APA, the Society for the Psychological Study of uh, Culture, Ethnicity, and Race, uh, the presidential theme then was looking at like healing through social justice. And I put together what I call the dream team, which are these amazing scholars and practitioners that you see here, doctors Brianna French, Della Mosley, Hector Adamas, Nayeli Ch uh, Chavez Duenas, Grace Chen, and Gioni Lewis. Um, as part of that, they really thought through how do we think about this and constructed the psychology of radical healing framework. Um, that framework was published in uh, the Counseling Psychologist. It first came out online in 2019, and then it was published two years ago. And I'm just going to give you some numbers, not to uh, just to tell you how much this resonates with people. I think um, somewhere between what, 40 plus thousand people have already viewed or downloaded the article. All of us that are part of the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective have presented research on various aspects of this. And it seems to speak to the communities in which we talk to, that people say, I appreciate looking at healing that incorporates who I am as a person, but connects it to the communities in which I belong to. So there is something there in this emerging framework that we have. There is more data that obviously needs to happen, but we are on um, the beginning parts of this journey. I'll identify some of these core tenets or core areas. I'll talk about each one separately. Some I'll spend more time than others. And then I'll think through like, well, what does this mean for recommendations for the NIMH? So when we think about radical healing, we really think about this dialectic where we're, people experience these interlocking systems of oppression and hate, racism, sexism, class exploitation, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera. But we are more than just the kinds of oppressions that we experience. We also have our own cultural traditions and strengths and our identities and communities exist outside of that forms of oppression. In addition, we are envisioning justice and liberation. We are envisioning a society in which we do not live with the constraints of these forms of oppression. We'll talk about critical consciousness, cultural authenticity and self-knowledge, um, radical hope, emotional support, and strength and resistance, not necessarily in this area, in this order. When we deal with critical consciousness, I think this is one of the areas that has the most developed uh, both conceptual and empirical literature that really captures what we want. Of course, when we think about critical consciousness, we have to acknowledge the important work of Paulo Freire um, and his uh, Pedagogy of Hope. Um, and we know that uh, Freire was influenced by people like Franz Fanon and others. And there's these three kind of critical components that people tend to operationalize. One is that is this critical uh, reflection. This is awareness that structural issues impact my lived experience right now, being able to name racism or name sexism or name their intersections, right? Um, there is a notion of political efficacy that not only do we have this level of awareness, but that we believe that we can do something to make a change. And then we have this critical action where we actually do some direct action to make changes. Just a really small trite kind of example. I uh, was during the COVID-19, my sister's 20 years older than me and wasn't able to get vaccination in her area. I listened to some of the reports that people were saying, here are some strategies. Um, we knew early on that African-Americans did not have the same access to vaccinations. And so I got on the phone, I called all of her, uh, the city reps that were in her area, people responded to me and I passed that along so that others can use the same strategy to get people in their families and communities vaccinated. Um, that's just a small way of just thinking smallly about political efficacy and seeing that that actually worked. 
There is a number of research uh, being done in this area. I really like the work coming out of Josefina, um, from Josefina Banalas and Alan Hope and Stephanie Rowley and other people working within there. And they're empirically thinking through what are models of uh, critical consciousness upon youth, um, what are processes in terms of family processes and with youth can kind of develop these and what are some of the educational and other outcomes. Most of the research done in this area focuses on youth. We also have um, Roderick Watts who does research in this area as well. Um, critical consciousness in children and adolescents. Here's a systematic review um, that appeared in the Psych Bull, and it talks a little bit about what component is leading to greater outcomes. And each one, um, some are more effective than others among certain groups. So we, we're getting some data here, and the data is complicated. It doesn't always work the way that we want, and so we need more sophisticated data to look at additional processes. Cultural authenticity and self-knowledge. We want to resist the uh, colonized ways of practices and ways of knowing. We know that our communities have a range of ways of knowing about health that we need to tap into to honor ancestral wisdom and cultural teachings about ways to promote health. Um, it requires also a sense of definition and cultural authenticity in which uh, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color are not just defined by their oppressors. Research in this area, there's a whole range of research in this area, particularly focusing on racial and ethnic identity and the importance of racial and ethnic identity. I feel over the past five decades, researchers, research has advanced in this area. Just the recent issue of the cultural diversity, ethnic minority psychology has a whole section on racial socialization and ethnic racial identity and importance and processes of that. Other cultural kinds of practices, there's more and more research being done on the importance of drumming and, the, uh, and drumming on health being done in a communal area, music. And of course, we have uh, the effects of Shinrin Yoku, which is forest bathing. And there are a number of uh, meta-analyses that talk about these forest bathing, which the concepts emerged from Japan and its benefit on reducing depression and anxiety has greater benefits on psychological health than it does on um, physical health. And that essentially is being in nature and actually using the senses that you have available to you to take in the healing components of that. It could be trees, it could be a forest, it could be a park. Collective emotional and social support. We know that there's a number of research in this area. Some of the more innovative ones that I think that we need more research has to do with um, we know that people seek connection with one's community and they receive support from that. Um, there was a recent report that the Association of Black Psychologists did in collaboration with the Alliance for National Psychological Associations for Racial and Ethnic Equity. Um, this is an important report. I encourage you to go out and get that. What they did was during COVID-19, they did a needs assessment of communities of color. And I remember um, when Dr. Cheryl Grills presented this work first at the National Association of um, ABCI, their, their conference, um, she talked about these findings and the report covers this. They um, interviewed and assessed over 2,500 people from around the country about their experiences during COVID, resources that were available to them. And one of the things that struck to me is that she concludes with this, we are our best medicine. Really through these interviews, what they found was the ways in which people of color, specifically Black Americans dealt with the isolation and dealt with COVID-19 was to talk to one another. That was what they identified as the most helpful. And it deals with more of this collectivity that many uh, BIPOC groups have. Newer research is emerging on this, creating counter spaces that affirm one's identity and healing. And these counter spaces could be 
uh, black Twitter, they can be so these electronic spaces. Um, if you're on college campuses, they could be the racial ethnic studies and um, cultural houses. If you're in your community, they can be churches or other kinds of support group. And these are ways that we build a counter narrative to the dominant narrative that says that we are problems, that we are just oppressed people. And that also builds and supports um, individual and community health. Strengths and resistance, um, just using individual and collective resources to transform environments and promote joy-filled lives. I'm gonna spend a minute of talking about radical hope. Um, the healing process, this is a quote from Sean Genwright who writes both about radical healing and radical hope among youth. The healing process fosters hope, which, in an, uh, which is an important prerequisite for meaningful civic engagement and social change. Together, healing and hope inspire youth to understand that community conditions are not permanent and that the first step in making change is to imagine new possibilities, right? I am so thankful for my ancestors um, who toiled this land to build the wealth of this country, not to give up, to realize that there is and the possible of a better tomorrow. Um, one that they might have not have seen, but one that they were able to uh, sow the seeds for so that we all can benefit, not just other African-Americans, but society as a whole. When we think about hope, uh, one of the most um, models that come up is Charles Snyder's model, right? Is this traditional hope. It's probably one of the most cited models. And hope here is really think, um, is viewed as this problem solving kind of future oriented um, concept that consists of agency and pathways. People have a sense of agency, like I've been pretty successful in life. I energetically pursue my goals. They know that they can um, achieve things to these pathways of getting to what they desire or their personal goals in the future. I can think of many ways to get out of a problem. We know that these notions of hope, these individual notions of hope are helpful. They're helpful for black, indigenous and other people of color. They're helpful for the general populations. We um, to deal with um, palliative care, to deal with cancer, to deal with the whole range of issues. Here is one recent meta-analysis that talked about the effects of media stories on hope and recovering on suicidal ideation. Um, what they found is that having these media stories or hope were helpful for suicide in reducing suicide ideation, but not necessarily in help seeking attitudes and intentions. But what of collective hope? If we are a collective community that values that, and we are dealing with some incredibly challenging and difficult times when we see people in our community put in cages, uh, when we see individuals in our community um, being shot and killed and having them be on TV, that takes a toll on us. And we sometimes begin to think, will it ever get better? I'm thinking about the groundbreaking work of Brandisha Tynes on the impact of viral videos, right? We know that youth who watch these videos of what was happening in, in um, ISIS and with immigrations and what's happening with shootings, that impacts us. And it can um, have people thinking, wait a second, is this permanent? Will things change? And that is why we need a notion of radical hope, which extends beyond our individual efforts to understanding that society can change and that we can be part of that. So radical hope involves this steadfast belief and the collective capacity contained within communities of color to heal and transform oppressive forces into a better future despite the overwhelming odds. 
Um, the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective have a conceptual model that we put forth that kinds of, that looks at the interdisciplinary literature all the way from there's whole ideas about resistance studies to history to sociology to psychology to religious studies to begin to unpack what does this collective hope look like. Um, some of the key features here that I want to kind of um, cue you into is that hope can exist both as this collective form, thinking about, um, thinking about the people who are similar to me or other oppressed groups, seeking justice, living a better life. And then it can also uh, have more of this individual orientation of me as, a, for me, it would be me as a Black American, what does hope mean for me? So it count, it looks at both collective and individual, um, and it takes into a broader range of a temporal look. So people who um, know the Sankofa bird, which is a Ghanaian uh, Adinkra symbol, that is the bird that is moving forward while looking back, right? So the, uh, the what's behind us is going to inform how we proceed forward. So it looks at the past, present and future. And that is what we're suggesting that Radical Hope does. I don't have time to go into each kind of dimension or tenet in more detail, but briefly broad stroke areas is um, history of oppression and resistance. The awareness that um, we come from people who have experienced horrible, horrible conditions whether it's attempted genocide, whether it's enslavement, whether it's um, um, uh, um, um, uh, labor exploitation because of our identities, that we've experienced that and we have survived through our resistance, not just acceptance of our conditions. And it's important to understand that our resistance has helped transform society, helped end slavery, help uh, promote um, um, voting rights, right? So that our resistance is pushing for a more just society, not just for BIPOC people, but for everyone. So pushing for democracy. And there's lots of historical work that documents this. The other is, is envisioning possibilities. Think about Afrofuturism. I love the work that's being done by psychologists now on Afrofuturism, um, thinking about multiple possible selves, thinking through, writing about um, what our future is gonna look like. And there's some now emerging data that suggests when you ask people to reflect on these um, possible futures, that it actually increases a sense of well-being. Other aspects are the meaning and purpose. So not only is it important that we I, uh, understand that hope is a possibility, but it's part of how we see ourselves and the contributions that we would like to make to future generations, as well as having a sense of awareness and pride in our racial and ethnic identity and our ancestors. We, uh, we just completed a qualitative study that begins to unpack these dimensions and expand this model more. And we are in a process of developing a quantitative measure so that we can begin to explore the impact of this collective and individual radical hope on BIPOC health. So some of the key points that I would really like to, uh, for you to take from this is that the psychology of radical healing is a health equity framework that emerging research supports, begins to support tenets of the framework that more research is needed to test the model in a more holistic manner that looks at both individual and collectivist well-being. I think people do, and psychologists focus on individual. We've got wonderful public health research that focuses on the collective, and really it's important to merge those two. More research is needed to support the development and evaluation of interventions based on the psychology of radical healing. Well, what does this all mean for say NIMH? Um, people who are interested in this, who are looking at um, research in health disparities. I um, 
talked to a range of people in thinking through um, some of these recommendations. And so I put forth knowing that uh, these recommendations, knowing that you are already along the process, some you have may be involved in and others not. You may dis completely disagree with the recommendations and that's fine. Um, and I also understand that the NIMH um, after the report of the disparities between black, um, Latinx and indigenous uh, researchers in terms of receiving R01 grants, that uh, NIMH has been doing some internal work to think about, well, what's going on and research along that area. I've had a chance to look at that report. So there's not, I tried to offer things that were different than were already considered. So one is to transform funding practices, really think about adopting fair and equitable. And what I'd like to name is this idea of race consciousness scoring practices. And so what, um, and so some of the other things, the bullet points here below will nod to, well, what would a race conscious scoring practice be? It's not necessarily giving people who are from an underrepresented background more points. It's deeper than that. So to ensure diverse and knowledgeable perspectives on racism and equity on review panels. So who is on the panel? Um, who is on the review panel? Do they look at um, what is their personal experience? What is their educational experience? Do they understand this? Not just say, oh, I read articles, but is there some formal training in this area? To invite uh, community practitioners and rep uh, our practitioners, representative of the target populations on review panels, Many times we are inward facing and looking at the science as opposed to being outward facing. How does the community receive our research? Do they identify this as an important area? What do they see as the implications of findings in this area? And that's where I really see that adopting a strengths-based approach is pretty important. Um, Include formal training in equity issues, especially related to targeted populations in the scoring application rubric. So here is some people might have lots and lots of research experience in NIMH funding, but have not done any research or formal training with African-Americans, Latinx, indigenous, um, um, Asian American um, populations, yet some of them are receiving funding and doing research that could potentially do harm to our communities. So it's important to think about what is the training of the PI? Have they taken formal classes, formal training in this area? Um, just like I know if I said I'm gonna do some sophisticated statistical analysis, people wanna know, well, are you trained to do that? It is the same in terms of these issues. So it's not just okay to have consultants. It really should be the people driving the conceptualization of the project. Encourage panel reviews to consider multiple epistemolo epistemologies, axiologies, and ontologies. Really, how is it that we understand data? What are some critical perspectives? What is our worldview about what research actually is? Um, so here, this is a nod to decolonial perspectives. Um, it's important that when we invite people to uh, review panels that we just don't expect them to acculturate to a system that has already um, um, reinforced inequity, whether it was unintentional, but there is a reinforcement of that. We want people to push the system, to think in different ways, who think differently from us. And a piece of that is people who adopt different epistemologies of understanding what even data is and what is uh, good science. I know that uh, Neil Lewis has an excellent article uh, in a recent issue of the American Psychologist that grapples with this. Identify radical healing among BIPOC as an NIMH priority. I know that the NIMH has four high level strategic plans. I think the fourth goal could um, something around radical healing among BIPOC could fit nicely into that. I also know that the NIMH has five priority areas in health disparities. 
Radical healing adds a health equity lens to what is already being done in the in, in IMH by um, because it operates from a strengths-based approach as opposed to a deficit model. It incorporates culturally syntonic approaches to healing and resilience as opposed to just focusing on disease and disparity. It emphasizes both individual and collective healing. And um, as we reviewed the health equity models earlier, it intentionally includes actions to dismantle oppressions. I was really excited to see among the five priority areas in health disparities, work with community members, looking at more participatory collaborative research. Kudos to you all for thinking about that and funding in those areas. Create, support, and fund radical healing spaces. I want to give a nod to a rather, it's a, a, a fairly older book, Healing Spaces, The Science of Place and Well-Being. This focuses literally on physical environment and built environment, but I think we can build on this by thinking about what are radical healing spaces, and radical healing spaces are physical, social, and virtual communities that promote health and thriving, particularly among people of color as they uh, work to transform the environments that they are in. I have an example here. Um, this is from a book, an edited book that I did with Lou Turner, that I edited with Lou Turner, who is a Fanonian scholar and a philosopher. And the book deals with Franz Fanon and contemporary practices um, that build on Franz Fanon's teaching. We had the honor of interviewing Dr. Lewis M. King, who was the director, founding director of the Fanon Research and Development Center in Los Angeles. It is um, not a center anymore. What's really interesting about this is that this center was funded by the NIMH in the 70s, right? There were these centers out there wanting to do this critical psych work. Um, they did phenomenal work in terms of creating this healing space where community members could feel comfortable coming in, identifying the issues that they thought were important. They per offered therapy. They also had um, artists who come in. They had politicians who came in or uh, folks who did policy work. And they had researchers, interdisciplinary researchers, geneticists, psychologists, historians, political scientists, all grappling with the issues that the local community identified as important. And the local community wanted to work on education equity and issues dealing with police. And they developed paradigms and did research and wrote policies on that. That is an example of a radical healing space. We have other examples such as the um, Children's Defense Fund, the Freedom Schools, they focus on developing critical consciousness among African American youth, they focus on instilling a sense of culture and history and building on strengths, they look at collectivity, so we have examples of that and data to support their efficacy. Establish a reparation exploration group. Woo wee, that's a word right there, right? Um, I know in there's a case for psychiatric reparations that they have been considering. Um, many times people erroneously think that reparations is just compensation, but we know that it is much more than that. It is about justice. The United Nations identifies uh, five areas of reparations that are critical to look at. The one that is most relevant, I think, to the NIMH work is rehabilitation, dealing with psychological and physical support. Um, it would be important to think about what is, what is NIMH funding um, to develop and provide free psychological and mental health services to those people most impacted by histories of racial um, uh, oppression. What does that look like? There are already um, agencies working on that. I know the William T. Grant had some um, um, had a support for research on reparations for Black American descendants of enslaved persons, but this would dig deeper to really think about the institution and what reparations means in terms of mental health in this country. And that would be looking at and ensuring that our science is tr is is meeting the needs of our communities. Um, because we know our communities 
really would like and need and deserve support to foster um, health and well being. And the last is to fund an equity, uh, health equity policy institute. I think many of us are thinking about these issues in isolation. And if we don't have people strategically looking on this in a, um, a long-term process, we lose continuity. Um, many times we're in siloed areas and we don't have this cross-pollination. The Fanon Center that I mentioned earlier had their thumb on the pulse. So such an institution would focus on producing research publications and policy work on health equity in BIPOC communities. It would consist of interdisciplinary scholars. We want the, uh, you know, the biologist, the psychologist, the historians, the theater people, the political scientists, the lawyers, other folks in humanities, all thinking together about this issue. We need multiple perspectives. And then part of this would include pathways to funding through NIMH fellowships associated with the Policy Institute. These would be NIMH um, funded uh, dissertations, pre-doc, post-docs, and visiting fellows. Um, those are some of my dreaming big with you, things that I'm inspired by radical healing um, that I hope will generate some discussion. Um, I want to thank you all for listening um, patiently. I want to do some shout outs to the members of the Psychology of Radical Healing Collective, members of the Liberation Lab, um, specific people that I checked with about these recommendations and just had questions about the presentations, Drs. Hector Adamas, Nayeli Chavez Duenas, uh, Brianna French, Gioni Lewis, Sharon Tetica, and Brindisha Tynes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Neville. It was really a wonderful um, talk discussing uh, the radical healing framework uh, and, uh, and a plethora of recommendations for us to consider both uh, in the context of that framework and other approaches to uh, our emerging priorities in, uh, in disparities research. And I'll just point out to you, uh, there are several uh, thank yous and wonderful talks in the Q&A in the chat. I have uh, plenty of questions to choose from, and we have just a handful of minutes. I'm going to start with one which I find, uh, you know, uh, uh, directly relevant, perhaps to the to the radical healing framework. Um, and uh, it, it, it the question asks, how do we find a balance between uh, claiming hope in order to improve our mental well-being, and uh, while still naming the violent reality that exists for many communities, uh, many BIPOC communities. That is such an important question and a, a realistic question because you don't want to um, have people have a false sense of, oh, we're gonna move forward, so let's not think about that. Um, we know um, and research, some researches, that righteous rage and anger could be important, that it, it, we can't move forward unless we name whatever our particular position is now. I think that is so important. But the problem, the way that hope comes into play is, is it means that we're not saying, and things will never change. It's saying we are experiencing this currently. How do we get ourselves out of this? So for example, let's think about um, apartheid. I remember in the early nineties in grad school where I was thinking apartheid is not gonna end in my lifetime. So just imagine if people said apartheid is a consistent thing, there will never be an end to it. And people like Mandela and other people didn't say, no, I believe that change will ultimately come. If that happened, we currently would not have the most progressive constitution in the world. If people weren't thinking behind the scenes about a tomorrow when it happens. So I think we can hold both possibilities in hand. Well, thanks. Uh, and uh, I'll just point out that many people have also put in there, thanks for the inspiring and hopeful work uh, that you're doing. Um, along those lines, uh, as, as you suggested, we at NIMH and at NIH more broadly really are uh, concerned very much about um, improving the equity of the review and grant making process. And so I, there's one question here uh, that notes that importance and then asks the question, do you have any recommendations for guidelines for scientific review officers, those who run the study sections for NIH, how they might consider 
um, restructuring a review or educating reviewers, particularly around that one point you were making uh, that we insist on evaluating for adequate training of PIs uh, in this work. Great. I just want to say I didn't have my notes and there was something I wanted to say earlier and that was sure. uh, I, grew, I went to public schools. I, I attended a university that I probably would have never gotten into. And I'm speaking to a funding agency that I have not received funding from and may never receive funding from. So I feel like a little bit of an imposter to say, here's what you need to do. Um, however, I did talk to people who have received funding from the NIMH in preparation for this. And I'm, I think having greater representation of who's actually in the room. So if you have people, um, I'm a Black Studies scholar, so I'll just say from my perspective, if you have someone who fits your criteria that is also trained in the discipline or have other you know, people in Black studies or what you know, Black psychology or whatever their area is, they will be able to help you think through what the possibilities are. But in terms of looking at the PI, um, at the scoring, I, you know, I'm not sure uh, it could be including a question. Can you please outline your training and experience in dealing with the population that you're proposing and to really encourage people to think thoughtfully in that area? Thank you. Uh, there's another question here about the radical healing framework, and it uh, asks, how can stigma be addressed in that framework? I, I suppose they, there might be various definitions of stigma. So I'll let you choose which one you might want to use. Okay. I think that's, um, I'm going to choose um, internalized oppression because it fits within the model. And there has been, I know Alex Petersey recently has a meta-analysis that deals with internalized oppression. I know that EJR David has done a lot of research on internalized oppression. So we know that when people internalize negative messages about their racial group, that that is associated with um, poor psychological outcomes, right? So the stigma has has to deal with the stigma of being of that group. So a piece of this, the counter of that, the way that this is, is the developing the critical consciousness because a piece of that is uncovering the awareness, but that blends in with that cultural authenticity and knowledge that promotes uh, one's racial and ethnic identity. Racial and ethnic identity could be a, um, having a sense of cultural pride can be a buffer against a lot of issues. So the stigma means how is it that we challenge internalized oppression? And I think the model allows uh, pathways to that. There's a question which I'll rephrase in order to um, uh, 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 in, in order to, to help uh, uh, frame it properly. So um, you discussed the context of the radical healing framework primarily with regard to BIPOC individuals, but of course, um, uh, diversity and disparity uh, aff afflicts other uh, underrepresented and discriminated against groups. And this question is specifically about um, disability. And I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, how this framework might apply to individuals with disabilities or to the questioner's point, the intersectionality between uh, racism, uh, other disparities and, uh, and, and disability. Thank you so much. Um, that definitely is a growth area of mine and I appreciate the question. And I think that the framework is designed to take that into consideration, to think about what are the ways in which black indigenous and people of color, um, how disability might uh, relate to people's experience. And so we need to be much more conscious and develop research around persons with disabilities who are BIPOC. Um, how to build on those strengths that talk about both race and ethnicity and take into consideration their um, um, various forms of um, ability, status, and disability. So I think that the framework is flexible enough, and that is definitely a growth area for me. Thank you very much again, Dr. Neville. The um, the kudos keep coming in. So if you if you need an ego boost, <laughs> just look at some of the QAs. Uh, some of them are in the answered section uh, as I declare them to get the other questions, but really a lot of appreciation here uh, for the work, uh, for the recommendations, for the representation as well. And, uh, and, and, and thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending uh, from NIMH and from far beyond. We had hundreds of attendees, and it's wonderful to see this engagement around this issue. Look forward to seeing you all at our next uh, 
uh, at our next Innovation Speaker Series a talk. And a reminder again, uh, if you would like to recommend to your friends, colleagues, and, uh, and others to see the talk, that it will be posted online at the NIMH website in the coming weeks. Thanks, Dr. Neville. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for the invitation.